Moderating this evening's dialogue, we are pleased to welcome Rachel Barkow. Rachel is a Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy and the Faculty Director at the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at NYU Law. Rachel's scholarship focuses on applying the lessons in theory of administrative and constitutional law to the administration of criminal justice. She has written more than 20 articles, is a co-author on one of the country's leading criminal law case books, and is recognized as one of the country's leading experts on criminal law and policy. She received the NYU Distinguished Teacher Award in 2013 and the law school's Podell Distinguished Teaching Award in 2007. In June 2013, the Senate confirmed her as a member of the United States Sentencing Commission. Since 2010, she has also been a member of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office Conviction Integrity Policy Advisory Panel. She served as a law clerk to, Lord, to Judge Lawrence Silberman of the DC Circuit and Justice Antonin Scalia of the US Supreme Court. She was an associate at Kellogg, Huber, Hanson, Todd, Evans, and Feigl in Washington, D.C. before joining the NYU Law faculty. Following Rachel, we will hear from additional distinguished NYU faculty, starting with Ernest Drucker, is research scientist and professor of public health at New York University, School of Global Public Health, visiting scholar at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, SUNY, adjunct professor of epidemiology at the Mailman School of Public Health, Columbia University, and professor emeritus in the Department of Family and Social Medicine, Montfiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He is a licensed clinical psychologist in New York State and conducts research in AIDS, drug policy, prisons, and criminal justice policy, and is active in the global public health and human rights efforts in the US and abroad. Kirk Anthony James is a clinical assistant professor at the NYU School of Social, Silver School of Social Work. His primary research and publications focus on deconstructing issues of mass incarceration, specifically as it pertains to trauma, cognitive development, culpability, and the examination of systems that foster and perpetuate racial injustice. He also worked collaboratively with the Center for Justice at the Columbia University on its annual Beyond the Bars conference, which brings impacted people together with academics, activists, poly policymakers, and practitioners from across the country to create a more informed understanding and subsequent response to mass incarceration. Michael Bosworth is a senior fellow with the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at NYU. From 2014 to the conclusion of the Obama administration, he served as deputy assistant to the president and deputy counsel to the president, overseeing all domestic policy legal issues. He also worked as special counsel to FBI Director James Comey Jr. and has served as a law, law clerk to three federal judges. Justice Stephen G. Breyer on the US Supreme Court, Justice Robert Katzman of the Second Circuit, and Judge Jed S. Rakoff in the Southern District of New York. Among other honors, he has been named one of Washington, D.C.'s rising stars by the National Law Journal, one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40 by the National LGBT Bar, the J. Michael Bradford Award from the National Association of Former U.S. Attorneys, and the Prosecutor, Prosecutor of the Year Award from the Federal Law Enforcement Foundation. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Well, thanks very much, um, Anna. Thank you for giving us some time to follow that great keynote speech. Uh, I've heard Glenn speak many times before. It's, it's riveting each time. It's kind of incredible that you managed to do that. Uh, so what we're supposed to do on this panel is give you about 10 minutes, and I think no more, because I think uh, we'll run a tight ship here to get everybody out on time, um, giving our own thoughts about criminal justice reform and where things stand. So I'm going to use my 10 minutes to, ex to be a little pessimistic here um, and to explain why I think we need to make sure that we pay attention to the fact that we get a system like this that produces things like Rikers, that produces the number of people that we have who are incarcerated because we have a failed process. Um, and it's destined to continue failing uh, unless we make structural changes about how we pass criminal laws and how we make our policies. So you put another way, I don't think we're gonna make a dent in mass incarceration or over criminalization until we fix the architecture that's responsible for it, that gets us into this mess in the first place. You just to step back, there's all the statistics that Glenn gave you and that you've heard about. Just kind of wrap your mind around the fact that one out of every three adults in the United States has a criminal record. I mean, that's an amazing statistic and it really requires us to ask, how do you get that? How do you get a country that produces that? So I want to step back and explain part of how we got there. So in the past four decades, we've had political forces in the United States that can 
You know, they consistently push us toward more criminal laws, harsher punishments, um, covering more conduct, uh, and it puts in place a group of people that have a vested stake in keeping that system operating the way that it does. So you get a bigger system, you hire more corrections officers, you hire more prosecutors, you have more police officers, um, you put correctional facilities inside rural communities that have no other source of income other than that facility. Um, you have a whole bail system that has a financial stake in keeping bail operating the way that it currently operates. And so you create this very large architecture of people um, they have a stake in keeping things the way that they're going. Um, and in addition to that, we pass criminal justice policies largely through the political system. It's a populist approach to this. Um, we don't usually have a rational evaluation of data and what we should do next like we do in many other areas. Um, instead, we basically make decisions with populist impulses. Um, and so that kind of decision making will produce harsher policies. Now when it first started, it didn't sort of spring out of nowhere uh, where people thought that they needed to get harsher. We had high rates of violent crime and social unrest in the 1960s, and a majority of the public was very fearful about what to do about it. Um, and so it primed voters to start supporting harsher laws. And the public continued to support those laws, though, even when crime rates started to drop, and significantly so in the 1990s. And that's because if you ask the average person um, whether or not crime rates are falling or going up, they, they tend to have no idea, right? Instead, they just always think crime is going up. Now this misperception comes from the fact that typically the public's gonna get their information from the media, some general impression from TV shows, and it's impossible to tell from media coverage what is actually happening with crime rates. So if you looked in the 1990s when crime was falling, news coverage of crime stories was increasing. Um, so Politicians know this. They know the public is kind of always primed for this idea that crime is going up or it's everywhere, it's just around the corner, um, and that they're concerned about it, and they typically want to show that they're concerned about that. They share that concern. So the way that politicians express that is to do it in a concise sound bite, right? Three strikes and you're out. Um, zero tolerance for whatever the crime is that people are concerned about. No more parole, no more coddling criminals. Um, let's crack down on violence. Uh, and it produces a culture uh, that, that lends itself to harsher and harsher policies. Um, now, it would be much harder for a politician to have to explain why um, reforms make sense because that requires you to talk about facts and talk about data. And unless you have a powerful story in response, um, which I think the movie did a really good job of, of doing that, uh, but unless you have that, it's very difficult to make the political argument on the other side. So for the most part, politicians find it risky to support criminal justice reforms. You know, And certainly outside very progress progressive enclaves like cities like New York City, uh, because they're worried that they're going to be vulnerable to attack, um, that they're insensitive to public safety. And in the meantime, you've got this big group of people, prosecutors and law enforcement officers, they're, they stand at the ready to criticize any reform because they want to keep things the way that they are. Um, and prosecutors have an incentive to do that because Broader criminal codes, harsher sentences makes their job easier. They can get plea bargains. You know, people stay in Rikers for a long time, they plead. Um, so there's an incentive for people to keep things as they are. And we have other groups in the system that, that do the same thing. So who's on the other side for reform? Um, unfortunately, for the longest time, we really didn't have much of anybody on the other side. Um, until recently, when you start to get people like Glenn and his organization, the ACLU, an organization called Right on Crime, which is a more conservative group, advocating for reform. Um, and you're seeing this now on both the left and the right, where there's people pushing for change. Um, so you might think, you know, then you shouldn't be pessimistic, right? We're on the cusp of really great big changes. Um, and you'll see that in some media accounts too where they'll talk about bipartisan criminal justice reform. So why am I still such a cynic? Um, and, and the reason is is because I think unless these groups are sophisticated about what it is that they're tackling and the big systemic problems in our system, we're just gonna nibble at the edges of a very large problem. So uh, if you look at most of the reform efforts so far, and Rikers I'll put in a different category that I'm gonna talk about in a minute because I don't think it shares this characteristic, but most of the other efforts focus on what Marie Gottschalk calls the non-non-nons, non-serious, non-violent, non-sex related offenders. All right, if you added them up in total, it's only about 32% of the total prison population in the United States. So imagine that, even if we legalized every drug, we would still have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, 
In addition, the reforms that people are suggesting for this non, non, non group are never that sweeping. They're never like, let's legalize everything that those people are doing. Um, instead, they're really modest. So it's taking the lowest hanging fruit and saying things like, possession in marijuana cases should be treated differently, or the lowest level of property crime should be treated differently. All right, and at the same time that you have that, you have on the other side still a push for harsher treatment in other areas. So you could have the same kind of reform movement for some kind of offenses, while at the same time there's groups pushing for harsher treatment of other things. And you can see that in response to the opioid crisis, for example. Right, that, That's the same rhetoric we've always seen in another area. Um, or you can consider the fact that the current attorney general is claiming at every turn that um, we need to get tougher on violent crime all over the country, um, even though it's only up in a few cities and down substantially in others. Last week, the department accused New York City of being soft on crime when it is the safest that New York City has ever been. Um, so this dynamic you can see again and again across the country. Yes, there are reforms, um, but they're modest, and they're really just teetering around the edge of this massive system of criminalization and incarceration. So even if you look at that clemency initiative that was discussed in the film, even that was pretty modest, right? It was just a tiny portion of federal prisoners um, who got any kind of sentencing relief. And many of the people who got commutations still have to serve really long sentences. So we had one client at our Clemency Resource Center at NYU, had no violence in his background. He was serving a life sentence for a drug offense. And he got a commutation from President Obama, which was wonderful. Um, but the commutation was to take his life sentence and make it 30 years. And he'd, are, he'd served 22, so he still had, with good time credits and whatnot, he still had five more years to go. Um, and, and you know, think about that. So that's a nonviolent uh, person who had committed a drug offense. And the benefit he got through that whole program was to get 30 years instead of a life sentence from a president who was, you know, had a commitment to criminal justice reform. Um, so, so my argument for you tonight is it's going to continue that way if what we rely on is just elected officials and prosecutors leading the charge for reform. They're necessarily going to have a conflict with their own professional self-interest, and they're going to cater to populist fears and impulses whenever they come up. Um, and at most, that'll allow us to just tackle the most sympathetic cases, you know, the people that have no violence at all um, or that have the lowest risk for reoffending. So if I'd have more time, I'd give you a whole laundry list of ex crazy examples of things we do that undermine public safety, but we do out of catering to these populist impulses. But um, I'm going to try to keep us on time and set a good example for the rest of us. You just trust me, there's lots of examples of this. Um, so, so the political process uh, is just not well suited to identify these problems or to fix them. Um, because you know one bad story is going to just undercut an entire program. All right, and the reason for that is because we don't do any kind of rational reflection typically of what are the costs and benefits of what we're doing. Are we increasing recidivism uh, later through the policies that we adopt? And just imagine if we treated any other regulatory area like this. If we decided, you know what, we're not going to have any vaccines for anyone because one person might find themselves um, harmed by the vaccine instead of saying, but actually this program or this policy in general yields lots of benefits. So we fail at criminal law, in my estimation, because most of the time we don't rationally reflect on what we're doing. And we use this populist approach. So we want real reform. I'll just quickly wrap up and tell you we need to fix how we make policies. So first we need to get more people who are experts in things rationally digging into facts and data, like the Lippman Commission, exactly like what Glenn said. Get them to see the data, get them to see the facts, and get them to see stories on the other side. The biggest reform we had at the federal level was from the Sentencing Commission, which is a bipartisan agency uh, that reduced drug sentences for almost 30,000 people um, because that agency made up of Democrats and Republicans that I serve on um, focuses on data. Um, additionally, we need to have the federal courts be a place that we really look to for enforcing constitutional protections. And that means we need a renewed focus on who gets on the federal bench in the first place. Um, for decades, we have had a bench dominated by prosecutors. 43% of the active federal judges in this country have prosecutorial experience, compared with about 10% who have public defense experience. Um, and President Obama's numbers on this were better, but only marginally so. So if criminal, criminal justice reformers want to be serious, I think they need to start paying attention to who gets appointed in the same way that other groups do. Um, when they care about their, their subject matter, they look and they say, who are you putting on the bench? Are you putting on the bench people who understand the system? So the other big reform that came out of our system in recent years was in California, where they reduced tens of thousands of people in their prison population because of a federal court decision. 
So I think we need to do uh, attention to federal courts. And then lastly and finally, we need more checks on prosecutors. Um, not only electoral checks where we hold them accountable for things, uh, like whether or not recidivism rates are going up and down, or what incarceration costs are, or whether they support things like Rikers, um, but also to have better metrics to judge them against and hold them accountable. How do they treat juveniles in their system? You know, are they paying attention to reentry and programming? So I'm going to stop there. And I know I spoke very quickly, but hopefully I basically stayed within the time. And I'm going to turn it over to our next panelist. We'll all talk, and then at the very end, we'll hopefully have a little bit of time for question and answers. Thank you.